We pray that you take these tapes and as they go out, as we record them here in these studies and as they go out, Lord, that you would bless them to other people's hearts. And we pray for those in our church that are sick now, those that are in need, and you know what those needs are. And Lord, we lift them up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn to 1 Corinthians. And uh, we quit on the, tw on the last verse of the of the uh, 12th chapter but I want to stay here I want to just uh, by way of 12 by way of introduction I want us to go back to this whole area of of what we learned last week this area of uh, what he gave to the early church and then the new list that he gave to the church after the early church. And uh, we see that the list is differently. Verse 28, if you remember, by way of review, he gave first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts and healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Uh, Back in Ephesians, uh, over in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, he revised that list. And uh, in verse 11, he gives us the new list. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's all he gave. And he says, this is all you're going to need in order for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. For how long? Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man, into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he revised the list, and what did he take out of it? He took out uh, miracles. He took out gifts of healings and uh, governments and diversities of tongues. So those things will disappear. Well, by the time we get to the book of Ephesians. Now, what is in between 1 Corinthians and the book of Ephesians chronologically? Chronologically, meaning time. Well, in the book of Corinthians, the nation of Israel was still in God's favor. Now, you remember this. Here's the key that the kingdom remember what they were preaching uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand so the kingdom was proffered to Israel on the basis of national repentance so if they had repented the kingdom would have come in all right now up to AD about AD 63 is when God shelled them he put them on the shelf and says, enough. No longer am I going to uh, uh, favor Israel. No longer is this message of the gospel of the kingdom going to them. I turn my back upon them. I go to the church, which is going to be made up of mainly Gentiles. And the salvation we've been talking about, they will hear. We know, of course, as the, as the Gentile church began from that point on, what was forefront as far as the message was the message of grace. Now, to show you this little dispensational boundary line, and for the benefit of our people who are listening by tape, particularly, turn to Acts 28 and 28. Always remember that what was before these verses, you had signs and wonders. What's after this verse that I'm going to read, there are no signs and wonders, and a brand new list had to be prepared. All right, in the 28th verse of the 28th chapter of Acts, be ye known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Now, within that statement, we understand that the gospel of the kingdom ceased to be preached which was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Therefore, the message to Israel or those people who belong to God but had turned their and turned away from God, that message to them had ceased. And the kingdom was no longer proffered to them on the basis of a national repentance because he was calling for a national repentance. Now, if you read verses ahead of this, verse 28, you will see like in verse 25 how Paul uh, repeated what Isaiah said, the prophet. And... Uh, after, this was after he had met with them for several days and had preached Christ out of the Old Testament. And in verse 24, it says, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Now, these were Jews. These were the people of the house of Israel. This was the last outpost, uh, if you might, if you will, of the, of the Israelites. When they were still in favor. Now, verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that God had, after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive, for the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now you come to this place in verse 28 again. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Now this is an important passage of Scripture. Uh, it began really in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah was commissioned by God and God told him to go and preach to these people and they wouldn't hear. And they wouldn't see. <laughs> but it wasn't totally, uh, this prophecy wasn't totally fulfilled until Paul came. Now it's being fulfilled totally. Now what, what God is saying here is because you put your fingers in your ear, you can't take them out. I'm going to hold your ear, ears, your ear, your fingers in your ears. You said, because you put your hands, your fingers on your eyelids so that they would stay closed, I'm going to put my hands upon your hands upon your eyelids so they'll stay closed. Uh, your, ha your heart has waxed gross. Your, ha your heart has... Uh, uh, your ears are dull of hearing, your eyes have they closed, and so forth. And for 2,000 years we've seen this as far as a people go. So he put them on the shelf. That doesn't mean that Israel, as a nation, that God is through with them. No, he was only through with them for 2,000 years. Individually, yeah, let's say got saved. When he comes back again, there will be a remnant that will be saved, and he'll say, this represents all of Israel now. Those that are getting saved, that those that are saved at his return, and those that belong to him back then, represents all of Israel. Paul says in another place, all that are of Israel aren't Israel. Just because you're born of Israel doesn't make you an Israelite. A true Israelite's one who's saved. All right, here is about A.D. 63. <clears throat> Everything that happens after. Acts 28, 28, chronologically, and that includes the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, uh, uh, Titus, you won't find one miracle, nowhere. You won't find any tongue speaking. You won't find anybody um, drinking strychnine and living. <laughs> Paul wrote this in jail, by the way. He was in, in, in uh, Rome, and after he, God turned his back upon them, then he wrote these epistles, and the epistles went back, was carried back to the churches. And one of the first things he did was revive the list. 
and uh, we know what the list is. We've, I read it to you in, in Ephesians, and I'll read it to you once more. Verse 10 of the fourth chapter, uh, verse 11 of the fourth chapter. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. The first list did not include evangelists. So now he added evangelists there. So he took away all the signs and wonders. There are no more signs and wonders. Why? Because Israel's not in favor, and the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians 1.22. But the Greeks seek after wisdom. Where's our wisdom that we seek after? In the Bible. In the Bible. All right, now that you've gotten that, so that you can understand... Uh, totally the teaching that I had began last week to show you that tongues are not for this age or not for this period I should say of the church and that all the other things like miracles miracles of, uh, of healings or gifts of healings and miracles which would probably be raising the dead and all these other things, diversities of tongues, they are no longer in force. Uh, now, with that, you know, in the 31st verse again in our review, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I you a more excellent way. And then he begins, <clears throat> verse 1, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love, agape love, or agape love, I am become as sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. Now he begins to show us the highest, uh, the highest uh, uh, thing that we can seek, the highest gift that we can seek, and that's the ability to love. And you have to do that with a new nature. You can't do that with the old nature. The old nature don't love at all, except itself. And most Christians live 99% of the time in their old nature. And you know, that's really a uh, task all our life. Every morning, every hour of the day, trying to dig down beyond the old nature and anchor ourselves in Christ in the new nature. <laughs> Uh, but I want to I want you to think along these lines too and uh, as we before we leave verse 1 our charismatic brethren anchor all that they do in this first verse this is their proof text uh, when he says I though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels I want to pause here uh, they they will say that they the so-called unknowable tongue rather than unknown tongue what's the difference you know, uh, you know unknown tongue is like if you start put speaking Russian it's a real tongue but I, I hadn't learned it so it's an unknown tongue to me <laughs> but an unknowable tongue is a tongue that they say is of the tongues of the angels so we can learn how to in our babbling speak tongues of the angels or things of that sort. And this is where they get it from. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Now here's an interesting thing. <laughs> the word angelos, which is angels, is used two different ways in the, uh, in the Greek. The word angelos, all, the, the word angelos, it just means uh, messenger. Now there's a heavenly messenger and there is a earthly messenger messenger for instance over in uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 uh, Jesus um, tells us about the uh, seven golden candlesticks which are the seven churches <clears throat> and then the seven stars in his hands are the seven angels of the seven churches and we have come to understand that more than likely what he is saying there is the seven pastors of the seven churches because they are earthly messengers 
For there is nothing in there is nothing in all the word that would indicate that God has ever placed an angel over a church. A heavenly angel. So we accept this since the message is going to the pastor of a church and uh, those that are in the churches and since he says to the people he who hath ears let him hear what the uh, uh, what what the uh, what he is saying then why not this why not as we come back to uh, verse 1 of chapter 13 why couldn't this also be the pastors when he says though I speak with tongues of men meaning all foreign language and then all of a sudden learn the tongues of pastors or those <laughs> who preach and those who teach. And I can speak their language too. Actually saying, suppose I had the gift of speaking in all kinds of tongues and I could get up and be and be and, and speak like a pastor <laughs> speak like a messenger from God a physical messenger and have not charity I'm become a sounding brass or a tingling system symbol now I'm not saying that that's what the interpretation is I'm saying that it could be either way <laughs> and there's no proof text anywhere else in the Bible this is the only place where this occurs tongues of angels in all the Bible and literally tongues of messengers so what I am saying is that the charismatic brethren of ours have a weak uh, proof text to prove that they can preach in or speak in languages of angels it's a weak proof text because that may not even be what God's talking about here because he just uses the word messenger that's all now in other places the word angelos means angels well how do we know the difference generally by the context context always decides now if he had to put heavenly angels here tongues of men and of heavenly angels then we would have known exactly what he was talking about that that would have been angels so we really don't know but I wanted to just po poise that to you or pose this to you so that you um, may understand that they are standing on weak ground when they use this as the foundation stone for their so-called ability to speak in unknowable tongues and call them the tongues of angels. Now we go on, verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and, could, and have not charity, I am nothing. Now charity is of course love and it's the highest form of love now you probably know by now that there are different levels that we call love in the English language the so-called word that the world uses generally is physical love and they use it in all our songs <laughs> they use it in all their love stories and even though there may be an attraction to that person, there's also a physical attraction too. This has nothing to do with physical attraction. It has to do with just pure love that God has. And that's the highest form. There's a phileo love, which is a love which is brotherly love. There's an agape o love. And phileo love and agape o love are almost the same, where you mentally say I will love that person and seek the best for him it's not it doesn't begin out of the heart but begins out of the mind phileo though is out of the heart excuse me agape is out of the heart this is the love that God had even before the foundations of the world that he loved but before there was man God was still loved, but who did he love? Before he created anything, who did he love? He loved the Son. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, Oh, God had to create man because he had to have something to love. 
God doesn't have to do anything, folks. <laughs> you can't you can't tell God he has to do something. No. No, God loved, but he had an object of love. And you can't love unless you have an object. There's no object there you can't love. His object was so was in the social Godhead. He had a love for his son. He's always loved his son. But this is the kind of love he's talking about here, and very few in the world understands this kind of love. Lots of times when we think that we're loving this way, this kind of love, and something happens, the object of our love, when that person does something to us that we want to get, <laughs> we want to get even, we find out wasn't the right kind of love, is it? Yeah, it's the wrong kind of love. This love, God goes on and describes it for us. Let me read it here, and, we and he describes it. Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Now he's talking about what's profiting. Uh, what profits a person. They can have everything, but if they don't have charity, there's no profit. Now he, cont he, he continues in verse 4 to give you a description of this love, kind of love. Uh, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doesn't boast, in other words. Uh, doth not behave itself unseemingly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoices in the truth. Beareth, uh, but, bear, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Folks, when you read this, and we examine ourselves in the light of it, we, we come to a dilemma. <laughs> Now, I can begin to hopefully give you a glimmer of this and how it can be effective in your life. When God has his will in your life and you're totally yielded to him through his word and you're in his will, he does the loving through you because you don't have the ability to love anyway but he counts it as your love. Do uh, you remember the scripture that says, work out, your, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in, in you and, and to will, pardon? Yeah, to his good pleasure. All right, now we have to have God working through us and to will through us his good pleasure. And the way we have to do that is a surrender. You say, well, I surrendered when I got saved. Yeah, you did. That's objective faith. That's an objective salvation. Now there is a subjective salvation. That is continuing, continuing, continuing. Not to save you from hell because you've already been saved from hell. But to save your soul. Have your soul saved at the judgment seat of Christ. That place where we're going to have to render, you know, to God what we've done in our bodies, whether good or evil, and receive those things. So the best that I can understand is this kind of love is automatic through us. If God is in total control and he has his will in our life. <laughs> Now, I hope that you probably see what I see, and I've been seeing this for years. You know, when you think that you're totally willed, when you're totally yielded to God and God has a hold of it, you find out if something little thing happens in your life, you either cut off his will and you take over, or you weren't in his will to begin with because old nature takes over 
And old nature says, uh, I'll love you, brother, as long as you love me, but when you quit loving me, I'm going to quit loving you. <laughs> we have a split. But the love of God's not that way. It doesn't seek as his own. It isn't puffed up. And uh, I'll have to confess to you, I don't know how to, I don't, I, I can't, you know, I can't say that that I can experientially uh, give this to you as this is always in my life. I think our human nature is always getting in the way. And it calls for a, not only a daily, but a moment by moment surrender. And in the uh, stepping and putting on the full armor of God and let, letting him live his life through us. And it's going to be a practice all the way till the day that we die and none of us will ever reach the perfection of it. I, I believe that we can live here upon the earth for a thousand years, study the Bible every day and grow and we would not ever reach the fullness. Only, only one man could do that and that was Christ himself. Because he was God. But still, he didn't say to seek it and to get it. He just said, seek it. <laughs> ah, this is the best gift. So it's really a goal, isn't it? Constant goal. And it isn't a constant goal to let this, to, to love this way, because we can't. It's a constant goal of surrender to let God do it through us, in his, through his will. All right. Uh, you know, even your faith comes out of this love. It says, believeth all things, see in verse 7, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Your hope that you have, the emotion that's attached to the kingdom truths, comes out of this love. All these things come from this love because it comes from the will of God. Now, verse 8, charity, or this kind of love, never faileth, never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall what? Cease. Cease, sure. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, in the early church, after A.D. 63, but before the Bible was written totally and canonized, God had special people in the early church. Special people. When they had a church service, I think we talked about this before, they would have prophets in there. God had given them the gift. He wanted them to tell the people something. And they'd stand up and start prophesying. And Paul, as a matter of fact, gave an order of worship. We're going to see in the next chapter, the 14th chapter. He says, if, uh, if you've got something to say to somebody, then say it in, a, in, a, in, a, in order. <laughs> Stand up and each one of you take your turn. Now, we don't do that anymore today. We have the pastor, we have the teaching, we have the preaching. The only ones that I know that still carry on that, uh, that transitional church period are the Quakers, some of that group. They'll sit, the women on one side and the men on the other side, and they face each other. And they just sit and stare at one another, and all of a sudden one of them jump up and start saying something, and they sit down. Somebody else will jump up and say something, and they sit down. But you see, there are three church periods, and I want you to get this in mind. The first one, from Pentecost to A.D. 63, and since that it was mainly Jews, there were signs and wonders. Now, at A.D. 63, we read it in Acts 28, 28 a while ago, God shall to Israel turn to the Gentiles, and all your signs and wonders ceased. But you see, there were certain people in the church who had gifts. Uh, in 1 Corinthians here, A.D. 63 hadn't come yet. So there were people here that could speak in tongues. There were, there were people who could give prophecies. 
And after A.D. 63, those who could give prophecies lingered on. You see, it says, there shall be prophecies, they shall fail. See the word fail there? It's the same word for vanish away down uh, in that same verse when he says, if there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Certain people had certain knowledge that they could stand up and give to the people because there was no Bible. No New Testament had been formed yet. Others could give prophecy. But this fade away is the Greek that means it doesn't come to a screeching halt. It continues. It continues and fades away. Now, in the same time, in the same term that it was fading away, the Bible was coming on. It was being written. I'm at the blackboard now. I'll show you what I mean. After A.D. 63, all tongues and wonders and signs cease here. We begin a brand new uh, church period. This ch brand new church period is a transitional church period. For they were being in transition from not having a Bible to having a Bible. Now, not having a Bible means that God had to have prophets and people with knowledge to tell them things. And as they began to vanish away, or fade away is a good word in the Greek, now I want you to look. The Bible in the other way was, was being written. <laughs> It was being written. Paul was writing epistles. Other Peter was writing his epistle. Uh, the gospels were being written. They hadn't been written yet. None of this had been written. The book of Revelation hadn't been written. It wasn't written until A.D. 90, something like that. Okay, uh, in the third century, this, I'm going to put this down here, third century, third century, I won't give you specific dates. The Bible was finished and it was brought together because it was scattered all out with letters and things. And God caused it to all come together. And then at one of the councils, councils of Nicaea, the Roman church had started, they proclaimed it in the, being the canon of scriptures. But before they proclaimed it, everybody had already accepted what was in our Bible as being the Bible. But they just proclaimed it as the canon of Scripture. So we call it canonized. So this period here and on for 2,000 years after this then would be called the biblical church because we have a Bible. Okay? This period before is the period early church. The first period is called the early church, signs and wonders. The last period over here is called the biblical period. In between the early church and the biblical period from A.D. 63 to the third century is called the transitional church. Being, being in transition from uh, those special messengers that God had to the, in the church, as they faded away, the Bible was coming onto the scene, was being written. Now that's exactly what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, Charity never faileth, it doesn't fail. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And it's the same word as vanish away, meaning little at a time. And then I want you to look at tongues. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Now that means in the vernacular, come to a screeching halt. <laughs> it means stop. There's no fading away. Just one day they were no more. 
And that happened in A.D. 63 when all signs and wonders ceased, along with raising the dead and uh, healing and all the other things. But for three centuries, two, two more centuries to go, there were, there were pro people who had prophecies, there were people who had uh, special knowledge, and they were fading away. And uh, in his early church, too, he, as you remember, as you recall here in Ephesians, you know, in his list, I'm going to read them to you again, because I'm going to bring you way over into the church period that we're in now. Uh, he said in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, I want to bring you back there. <clears throat> and he gave some apostles. Do we have any apostles anymore? No. There's only 12 of them. They died. And some prophets. There's no more prophets. They faded away. <laughs> and some evangelists. That's something brand new. And some pastors and teachers. Evangelists are those, as we said last week, are those who go to preach where the message has never been preached before we call them missionaries and after the churches are started and then some pastors and you'll notice after the word pastors there's no comma there's the word and teachers in the Greek it means pastor teachers meaning if a one, one's a pastor he's a teacher and if, a, if, if one's a teacher he is a pastor all right we're living now in the biblical church and the pastor teacher uses the Bible and he takes uh, over to feed the church. Now, verse 9. Uh, we're going to be here in verse 9, 1 Corinthians. So let's turn there, back to that. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Now, that's not you today. He's talking about people who lived <laughs> before A.D. 63. We know in part. Why do we know in part? Because we don't have the Bible. And we prophesy in part. We don't have anybody prophesying today because we have the Bible. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, what is he talking about there? That's right. The Word of God. Nope. Nope. We're going to see it's in contextually. He's still talking about this transitional period here. See? At that particular time, they knew in part, and we prophesied in part, but when that which is perfect, or that which is completed, the word, is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And the in part was the prophets and the uh uh, people who had special knowledge in the church. They're done away with. We don't need them anymore. Now he <clears throat> uses an illustration here, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Okay, now he's using that illustration as an analogy of this. When I was a child over here, <laughs> living in this area, I thought as a child, you see. I had childish toys. I understood as a child, see. Then when I became a man, I put away childish things. Here we are now in the biblical church. We need to put away the toys of the baby. We got the Bible. We got that which is perfect. <clears throat> We got that which is, uh, that uh, has come into being. We're in the biblical church now. But yet we still have some people trying to live back before A.D. 63, don't we? Well, we have them. They're, they're like uh, uh, those that think they can still do miracles and healings and uh, speaking in, uh, in unknowable tongues. Or like a child sitting in a bathtub with a rubber duck. They're still playing with their toys. And you can't teach a child anything. Uh, they have to grow into manhood. They haven't grown. And that growing has to do with the Word. Now verse 12. For, we, for now we see through a glass darkly. Now this literally means 
like a mirror that's all fogged up. How many more minutes do we have there, Kelly? About five? Okay. For now we see through a glass darkly, like when you look in a mirror and it's all fogged up, you can't quite see. That's what that's how they were living. They didn't have any Bible. They saw little things in that period of time, see? Then, but then face to face. You see, now, here we have something. When you have the Bible, the mirror is clean. I'm going to come back here next week, but, but the Bible tells us, not, not next week, but the next time that we, that we come, the, the Bible is like a mirror, and we can see Christ face to face in it. But its implication is that there is no more revelation of Christ. We have it all. One day we'll have the full revelation of seeing him face to face. Uh, when we say full revelation, we just simply say, we mean not by faith, but by sight. Well, we can see him now by faith, but we have a full revelation. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. The application is after the word comes. Now I know in part, I don't know much about what he wants, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I know him through the word. Of course, this is by faith. And one day we will know him also by sight because we'll be in heaven. And then he ends up the chapter. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. Why? Anybody know why? Pardon? Here's another reason. It's a good reason. Here's another reason. There goes, there's going to come a day when there's no faith. It'll cease. It's going to come a day when there's no hope. It will have been met. <laughs> But what will remain? Love. Love. It will always remain. That's why it's the greatest. <laughs> All right. Father, dismiss us in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> I hope you all understood that chapter.